Just a quick word before the start of this video. This has probably been the most time consuming lore video I've ever made thus far. If you'd like to support me, you can head over to my Patreon page. As a supporter, you can watch these videos as free and with early access. Hope you enjoy the video. On Istvan 3, a terrible atrocity had occurred. Four legions of Astartes had forsaken their oaths of loyalty to the Emperor and turned upon their brothers. Those deemed unwilling to follow the War Master in his corrupt plans had been selected to be sent to their deaths on the planet below. Horus would take all of them out in a single swift strike through the use of the lethal virus bomb. But due to the heroic last minute warning of Sol Tarvitz, many had been able to find underground shelter in time and survived the Life Eater virus. And under his leadership, they managed to organize a valiant resistance. Knowing they were severely outnumbered, the loyalists hunkered down in the ruins of the capital city and held out for as long as possible to buy the rest of the Imperium time to respond to this unfathomable betrayal. The survivors of the various legions stood united against the War Master's forces and his corrupted Primarch brothers. But despite their valiant last stand, in the aftermath of the battle, a final orbital bombardment turned the planet and the few remaining loyalist survivors upon it into dust. The ruins of Istvan III's coral city had become their tomb. The first step of Horus's mission to overthrow the Emperor had been completed. The last loyalist remnants had been successfully purged from their legions. The Sons of Horus, Death Guard, World Eaters and Emperor's Children had irreversibly betrayed the Imperium. By spilling the blood of their brothers they cemented their loyalty to the War Master. Now there would be no way back. But not everything had gone according to the War Master's plans. Unlike the other loyalists, Nathaniel Garrow had not been sent down to the surface of Istvan III due to the grievous leg wound he had suffered on Istvan Extremis that had not yet recovered. He was not fit for active combat. Assigning him in the drop pod assault would have raised suspicion. His treacherous Primarch Mortarion still had hopes of swaying the promising captain to the traitor's cause, and so instead Garrow had been assigned command of Eisenstein, a small frigate in the Death Guard's fleet. But First Captain Callus Typhon had not trusted Garrow as much. On his orders, another Death Guard captain called Ignatius Grulgor and his squad of traitors had been purposefully stationed on the Eisenstein to make sure the ship would comply with the firing of the Life Eater virus payloads in the upcoming bombardment. Should Garrow indeed get in the way of following these commands, Grulgor was ordered to murder him and take control of the Eisenstein. At this point in time, Garrow was yet unaware of the looming tragedy. By now, his sworn honor brother Sol Tarvitz had boarded the stolen Thunderhawk and was on his way to warn the loyalists on the surface of Istvan III about the impending bombardment. When he contacted the Eisenstein, he informed Garrow of the horrific betrayal that had been orchestrated by the War Master and the impending virus bombing. As Garrow and his entourage made their way to the gun decks, a fight broke out on the ship between the traitors and the loyalists. In the midst of the battle, several containers of Life Eater virus munitions accidentally exploded on the ship. As the deadly green clouds started making their way through the gun decks, deckhands and Astartes alike perished in agonizing death. But by quickly sealing the ship's uncontaminated compartments, further spread of the virus could be avoided, and the remnants of the virus were eventually flushed out into the void through the airlocks. Fortunately for Nathaniel Garrow, all the traitors aboard the Eisenstein had perished in the accident. However, a large portion of the loyal crew had remained unharmed and the ship could be kept operational. By now, the only remembrances who had survived the massacre on Horus's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, found refuge on the Eisenstein. Among these were Euphrati Keeler, Kirill Sinderman, and Mercedes Olaton, who had been assisted in their narrow escape by the ancient Astartes Iacton Cruz. As the loathsome bombardment on Istvan III commenced, now would be their best chance to slip out of the formation and leave the system. But their departure would not go completely unnoticed. One of the communication officers on board the Eisenstein had misread the situation. In his perception, Garrow was a traitor for disobeying direct orders from the War Master, and so in secret he signaled a warning message back to the Death Guard fleet. 
Upon receiving the distress call, Callus Typhon, in command of the Terminus Est, sprang into action and began his pursuit of the Eisenstein. His large battleship was one of the most powerful in the entire fleet, and it wielded a significant amount of firepower. Given the chance, it would easily blow the Eisenstein from the void. Soon, its lance batteries were firing upon the much smaller frigate. The Eisenstein would need much more time before it would be ready to make a warp jump and escape. For the time being, their only hope of survival was to deploy all available power to the void shields and try to outrun the lumbering Terminus Est. In their desperation, the Eisenstein steered a dangerously close course through the gravitation field of a star in order to accelerate themselves out of the pursuer's reach. By utilizing the gravitational pull for momentum, they could now transfer all their energy from the engines to the warp drives. Despite the void shields being powered to full capacity, the cannonade occasionally broke through and scored several hits. But the Eisenstein was now steadily sailing out of the pursuer's firing range. The much heavier Terminus Est would not be able to safely follow it through the star's gravitational field and would have to disengage. In a final attempt to score a crippling blow, Callus Typhon ordered a huge salvo with all guns at once. The lance batteries hit their target and dealt severe damage to the Eisenstein. They had almost succeeded in bringing down the fleeing ship. Large swaths of its hull had been breached and many of the crew lay dead. Several more shots would have been enough to blow up the ship and blow the Loyalists into the void. But it was too late. Utilizing the last of its power, the now severely damaged Eisenstein barely managed to make a warp jump. As the Immaterium opened up, Eisenstein successfully escaped. But their voyage would not go without its troubles. Under normal conditions, traveling through the warp was already unpredictable enough. But to aid Horus and conceal the dark conspiracies taking place on Istvan, the gods of chaos deployed their might to conjure up severe warp storms in the Sigmentum Obscurus that hindered travel and communications. Commonly used warp lanes were now too dangerous to cross, and many astropathic messages never made it to their destinations. These severely unstable circumstances would make the predicament of the Eisenstein troublesome indeed. But to make matters worse, during the pursuit their Geller field generator had been damaged. The thin veil protecting those on board from the horrors of the warp was starting to fail. If the Geller field shut down completely, there would be no telling what horrors and madness awaited the crew. It would remain to be seen if Nathaniel Garrow and his crew would ever reach Terra in order to warn the Emperor, or if they would be lost to the insanity of the warp forever. Meanwhile, on Istvan, the War Master was preparing the next stage of his plan. During the fighting on Istvan III, Fulgrim had returned from his unsuccessful diplomatic mission to sway Ferris Manus to the traitor's side. The Iron Hand's refusal to side with Chaos meant the traitors would remain outnumbered. But before his departure, Fulgrim had been able to deal a significant blow to the Iron Hand's fleet and severely damaged many of their ships. Despite Ferris now being aware of the traitor's plot, his helplessly crippled flotilla would be unable to contact the rest of the Loyalists. And so for now, the Imperium remained in the dark about what had transpired. But Horus knew that as soon as the Loyalists were able to gather their retribution fleet, they would make haste to Istvan in full force. Time was of the essence, and so he gave Fulgrim the order to travel to Istvan V and prepare the defenses there. For their base of operations, they chose an abandoned Xeno stronghold overlooking a large ravine called the Urgol Depression. To withstand the Imperial forces, the old fortress and its defenses would need to be repaired and reinforced. Fulgrim made up for his earlier failures by expertly supervising labor teams ordered to create a vast network of earthworks, trenches and bunkers positioned along the ridge of the Urgol Plateau. They installed anti-aircraft batteries and portable orbital defense stations that would have to prevent the Imperial fleet from simply bombing these fortifications from lower orbit. When the conflict back on Istvan III concluded, the entirety of the War Master's fleet traveled to Istvan V and moved into these newly fortified positions. Waiting for the Loyalists to arrive, they got themselves comfortably dug in. But as secure as the traitors would be in their new defenses, their fleet in orbit would be a different matter. It was estimated that the Imperium Retribution fleet would vastly outnumber them, and so it would be unwise to engage in a full-out naval battle. Unlike the troops on the surface below, in the vast openness of space, the traitor's fleet would not have a defensive advantage. 
For now, Horus had little use for these ships, so he ordered the flotilla to abandon the system until the battle was over. If his ground forces were to be victorious on Istvan V, he would need all the available vessels undamaged and ready so he could sail the entirety of his army towards the Sol system and besiege Terra. Even though the Imperial Legions would be granted free orbital supremacy, by now the defenses on the planet were so formidable that it was unlikely that any orbital bombardment would be able to dislodge the defenders from these positions. If the Emperor's Legions wished to destroy the traitors hunkering down on Istvan V, they would have to come down to the surface in person and fight man to man, where the defenders would have the advantage. The stronghold would be the perfect base of operations to weather the storm and wait for further forces to come to the traitors' aid. As of yet, the Imperium was unaware that the entire Wordbearer's Legion and several bribed elements of the Mechanicum had already turned to chaos. This unpleasant revelation would surely catch the Loyalists by surprise, and it would remain to be seen if even more forces could be persuaded to join the Warmaster's side. Meanwhile, the Eisenstein and its crew were in grave danger. Due to the failing Geller fields, the warp had an overwhelming influence. The vessel had in fact been plagued by a demon incursion when Nurgle revived previously killed Grulgor and the other Death Guard traitors. These would be the first ever plague marines. Their undead husks were now rampaging throughout the Eisenstein. In the upheaval, the ship's only remaining astropath was killed, ruining their only chance of successfully navigating the warp. These events forced Nathaniel Garrow to order an emergency exit from the warp in order to save the ship. Back in real space and without a connection to the power of their patron god Nurgle, the plague marines were cut off from the power source that sustained them, and they were easily slain. Although having narrowly avoided their complete destruction, the Eisenstein now found itself stranded hundreds of light years away from any inhabited space. In its damaged state, the vessel would never be able to reach Terra. In a desperate attempt, Garrow ordered the shipmaster to overload their warp drive. Hopefully this powerful explosion would be able to generate a strong rippling signal through the Immaterium that a passing Imperial starship could come to investigate. To their great fortune, the explosion of the warp drive did indeed serve as a functional beacon and attracted the attention of no other than the mighty Imperial Fist's fleet. On orders of the Emperor, Rogel Dorn and his entire legion had been on their way back to Terra when they had been caught off guard by a warp storm. As fate would have it, the Astartes flotilla had been waiting nearby for the worst of the storm to pass when they noticed the signal. Nathaniel Garrow and his crew were taken on board Rogel Dorn's flagship, the Phalanx, for interrogation. The stubborn Primarch was initially reluctant to believe the outrageous claim that his very brother Horus Lupercal, trusted War Master of the Imperium, would betray their father. After hearing these accusations against his brother, Dorn became so enraged that he almost killed Garrow in anger. But after hearing the same story from multiple witnesses, he would eventually consider the possibility of their claim being true. As the warp storm and the Primarch's temper passed, they continued their way towards the Sol system. As Rogel Dorn sought counsel with the Emperor to discuss the news, the Eisenstein survivors would in the meantime be interred within the Somnus Citadel on Luna. Here they would undergo more interrogations by the Sisters of Silence to find out the truth of what had happened. It would not be until they eventually received confirmation by Ferris Manus about the events on Istvan that the severity of the situation became undeniable. By merit of seniority, Rogel Dorn, also known as the Praetorian of Terra, had been assigned supreme commander of all the Imperial forces. In the face of civil war, the Imperial Army mustered extra troops and requests for Mechanicum reinforcements were sent to Mars. Fabricator General Kalbor Hull answered the call, but unbeknownst to the Loyalist, a large portion of the Mechanicum had already been bribed and would side with Horus in the coming conflict. The Dark Mechanicum, led by Kalbor Hull, could not yet openly march against the Imperium, but in secret the schism of Mars and the start of their own civil war had already been set in motion. The Imperial Army, Legio Titanicus, and Astartes Legions were now ready to travel to Istvan. However, the Imperial Fists themselves would not take part in this fight. The Emperor had requested the Seventh Legion back to Terra for another purpose. Rogel Dorn's expertise as a master builder would be required to improve the Throne World's fortifications. Ferris Manus was appointed to lead the Retribution Force in his stead. After the personal betrayal and humiliation by Fulgrim, the Gorgon was eager for revenge. The very fact that his traitorous brother had even considered the possibility that Ferris would freely join their ranks was a stain on his honor. 
Who else considered him a man of dubious allegiance and potential turncoat? He would personally see to it that his loyalty to the Imperium would never be in doubt again. And so he wasted no time and gathered the army to make way towards the Istvan system. Approaching the system, they would rendezvous with the other loyalist legions. Amongst the first to arrive would be the Raven Guard, under command of Corvus Corax, and the Salamanders led by Vulcan. Together, these brother Primarchs would form the vanguard of the Retribution Force. In preparation for his rebellion, the War Master had sent the Blood Angels, Ultramarines, and Dark Angels on expeditions out in the furthest reaches of the galaxy. By now, these Loyalist Legions would be too far away to be of any help in the coming fight. The White Scars were still hunting down the remnants of the fallen Orc Empire, but due to warp storms had been unreachable. Meanwhile, Lehman Russ and his Space Wolves were on their way to arrest Magnus the Red on Prospero, but the Vanguard would not be on their own. Soon, they would be joined by the other available legions, Perturabo and the Iron Warriors, Alpharius and his Alpha Legion, the Night Lords led by Conrad Kurz, and finally, the Wordbearers, under the command of the still believed to be loyal Lorgar Aurelion. They were all heading towards Istvan to join the battle. Less hot-headed than his brother Ferris, the thoughtful Corvus Korax sent forth a stealth reconnaissance ship into the system to scout out the potential battlefield. To their surprise, not a single enemy spaceship was encountered. All enemy vessels must have left the system. As it passed the dead planet of Istvan III, their auspexes were able to confirm the ruthless betrayal that had occurred there. Where once stood the thriving capital of the Coral City, now only ruins and dust remained. There was not a single sign of life on the planet. But when the stealth ship encountered a concentration of Vox signals coming from Istvan V, it was able to pinpoint the traitor's hideout in the Urgol Depression. As far as Ferris Manus was concerned, the attack could begin. Corax and Vulcan counseled caution. Perhaps it would be wise to wait for the other Loyalist legions to arrive first and attack together. But the Urgol Depression had been wisely chosen by Horus indeed. Within the confines of the ravine, there would not be enough room for seven whole legions to deploy and attack all at once. A selection of legions would have to go in first, and Ferris Manus would certainly see to it that the vengeful Iron Hands were amongst the first wave. Now that the traitor's exact whereabouts were known, the Primarch could not contain his lust for battle. He yearned for the opportunity to punish the traitors, and in particular Fulgrim. It would be better to strike now rather than allow the traitors any more time to prepare. And after all, they clearly had the upper hand. When the other legions would inevitably come to reinforce them, the tide of battle was guaranteed to turn in their favor. The freshly arrived Astartes of their brother legions would easily mop up whatever traitor's resistance remained after Ferris Manus was done with them. And so he proposed that the Iron Hands, Raven Guard, and Salamanders would go ahead and lead the glorious spear tip. There would be no delay, the battle was about to begin. But even the Gorgon would not be so foolish as to assault against prepared defensive positions without first ordering an orbital bombardment. Without the traitor's navy to oppose them, they could freely bring their combined fleet into lower orbit and proceed bombing the surface with their heavy payloads. This would, at the very least, soften up the defenses and make a planetary landing somewhat easier. As the large fleet moved into position, they began pouring all their firepower into the traitor's fortifications. A huge cannonade smited the planet below. The stronghold within the Urgol Depression was covered in explosions and the ground shook under the destructive force of their guns. Lance strikes scorched the earth wherever it struck. The traitors would reap what they had sown, and they would be shown no mercy. The intensity even eclipsed the final bombardment on Istvan III. The portable defenses stationed out on the plains stood no chance and were crushed before they were able to respond in kind. But by and large, the portable void shield network in the Urgol Depression managed to withstand the worst of the damage. Here and there, dugouts and anti-air defenses were blown to pieces. Direct hits against fortified bunkers managed to wound or even kill the hunkered down Astartes inside. But considering the immense cannonade laid against them, the overall impact on the traitors was minimal. The bombardment had failed to break open the fortress. Meanwhile, the remaining defense laser batteries on the surface, below, returned fire. The Loyalist fleet would not be able to withstand the ongoing duel forever. Despite their own strong void shields, sooner or later they would run the risk of losing their ships. But they would have to stay engaged for a while longer. After all, their primary purpose was to keep the traitor's anti-air defenses suppressed and unable to concentrate their fire against the drop pods, stormbirds, and landers carrying the Loyalist troops to the surface below. The attack orders had been given. With oaths of vengeance on their lips, the space marines of the three loyalist legions began their assault. Thousands of drop pods darkened the skies of Istvan V as they came hurtling through the clouds. 
In an attempt to take out as many invaders as possible, the anti-air defenses fired whatever could be spared at them. The oncoming airborne assault was saturated in a dense cloud of flak. During their descent, several drop pods exploded and burst into flames, but these losses would not be nearly enough. The tidal wave of attackers kept coming. Their landing sites had been carefully chosen by Ferris Manus, and they crashed into the outskirts of the defenders just outside of the Void Shields. Unsurprisingly, the first to disembark were the Morlock Terminator elites of the Iron Hands, personally led by the Gorgon himself. They wasted no time and immediately charged the traitor's center. The Raven Guard under command of Corvus Corax moved up on their right, while Vulcan and his salamanders took position on their left. Despite the artillery barrage immediately thrown against them upon Planetfall, the elite of the Loyalist forces led by their Primarchs began cutting their bloody path towards the traitor's main stronghold. The traitor forces moved against them. In the center, the Emperor's children faced the onslaught of the Morlocks, the Imperial Army and World Eaters to their left, and the Sons of Horus holding out on the rocky slopes of the Urgol Depression. To their right, more Imperial Army troops and the Titans of Legio Mortis held against the Salamander's advance. And to their far side, the Death Guard were prepared to hold the flank. The front lines clashed and thousands of bolters thundered at point-blank range, splintering ceramite armor and reaping a bloody toll amongst both sides. As the battle commenced in full force, it was obvious that this would be a fight like no other. This was no battlefield for mere mortals. In the face of the superhuman onslaught, the Imperial Army elements were quickly brushed aside. Their function on this battlefield seemed a mere expendable meat shield to soak up firepower. But where Astartes battled Astartes, the fighting was ferocious. No quarter would be given, and none was expected. With neither side backing down, every inch of ground won would come at a high price. In such close quarter combat, it was nigh impossible for Legio Mortis to fire their heavy weapons without resulting in friendly fire but they would soon be presented with more suitable targets. The Stormbirds and landing crafts finished their descent and landed in the Urgal Depression behind the Vanguard. More Space Marines disembarked and rushed up to take their place into the already packed front lines. Imperial Army troops made Planetfall as well and began positioning their artillery to provide supportive fire. A mass of tanks rolled from their landing craft and moved into firing positions. Within half an hour, the bulk of Imperial forces had successfully reached the surface and formed up according to Ferris Manus' battle plans. Their artillery guns and tanks, now ready to pour their firepower against the fortress and relieve the bombarding fleet above. Their landing had not gone unopposed. Towering over the battlefield, the mighty Imperator-class titan Dies Irae outpowered and outranged anything the Loyalists could field. It had a field day blasting its weaponry into the Loyalist rear lines disrupting the supply lines and making the evacuation of wounded troops nearly impossible. But against the wall of fire now thrown back at him, even the mighty Imperator was forced to partly withdraw back into the fortress. Several Warhound Titans had their void shields overpowered and were destroyed amidst the traitor lines. Having suppressed the bulk of the defenders' guns, now it was time for the Loyalist Titans to bring their god machines to the surface. Huge bulk transporters touched down in the rear of the lines, Legio Ataris, the Firebrands, marched forth, bolstering the Imperial forces and firepower even further. Over the heads of the troops, Titans engaged each other in long-range duels. Their massive laser weapons scorched the ground and troops below as it passed overhead. A wall of deafening noise now echoed throughout the Urgol Depression. Imperial army units covered their ears in vain as sonic booms shattered their eardrums. The mere overpressure of their weapons fire killed friendly troops unfortunate enough to stand too close by. The Loyalists were now truly getting the upper hand. Ferris Manor, still leading his Morlocks on the front, wedged the traitors' forces apart. The Primarch crushed and killed traitors with his bare silver hands, ripping apart any foe who dared stand in his way. No one could stand against him. But the corrupted Emperor's children holding against the Iron Hand's advance relished in the bloodshed. Apart from the violet color of their power armor, these Astartes were no longer recognizable as the once proud Third Legion. Under the patronage of Slanesh, they had transformed into hedonistic wretches. They had desecrated their armor with strange symbols and chanted unintelligible taunts at their foes. Even meeting their own brutal end had become an ecstatic pleasure to the experienced. And so instead of retreating, they would willingly throw themselves in the path of the Gorgon. 
But despite the blessings of their newfound chaos masters, Horus realized the traitor lines were beginning to break. Sensing the imminent danger, he finally ordered his brother Primarch to take to the field. Sallying out of the fortress, the bloodlusting Engron was the first to countercharge. Wielding his dual chain axes, he struck the loyalist lines like a thunderclap. The savage might of the Red Angel of Butchery could not be denied, and he began driving a wedge between the Raven Guard and Iron Hands. Fulgrim joined the center of the battle where his Emperor's children were held against the Iron Hands, and on the right side of their lines, Mortarion raised the morale of his Death Guard by joining the battle. With great sweeps of his scythe, he cut down any salamander foolish enough to oppose him. Even as the Loyalist attack already stalled against this renewed fury, more traitor troops appeared from the fortress. First, Captain Abaddon and his Terminators joined the fight and countercharged with unremitting savagery almost rivaling that of Angron. On the edge of the Urgol Depression, traitors once again appeared on the high grounds and fired their weapons into the masses below, subjecting them to a deadly crossfire in their flanks. Hidden bunkers behind the Loyalist front lines opened up and suicide squads of traitors charged into their rear. The bulk of the army infantry troops were now driven forward by their masters to overwhelm the Imperial forces in sheer weight of numbers. Space Marines in the front lines were swarmed by a literal mass of bodies that prevented them from maneuvering or using their heavy weapons. With barely any room to swing a sword, those in front had to resort to using their fists, punching and crushing those around them. Even without weapons, they were able to pulverize the wave of human infantry thrown against them. In the gory melee, several Astartes had the joints on their armor become jammed by the sheer amount of gore and shrapnel that was washing over their ranks. Legio Mortis, escorted by mechanized armor and traitor jet bikes, started marching forward to deliver even more death and destruction upon the battlefield. But the counterattacks would not go unchecked. In order to stem the tide, Loyalist reserve troops rushed headlong into the battle. Almost all Loyalist Space Marines were now engaged in close quarters combat. Any semblance of a battle line dissolved into a disorderly mosh pit of death. The tidal wave of human infantry was met with flamers. The salamanders literally scorched away the swarm of bodies covering their power-armored brethren. The mob of infantry literally melted away before their very eyes. Burned bones and thick cakes of blood and gore crunched as the servitor-assisted armor of their encumbered brothers came back into motion. Gunships took off and used their heavy weapons to strafe the traitors on the higher grounds, forcing them to abandon the ridgeline. This, however, exposed the aircraft to anti-air defense batteries stationed on the fortress, resulting in many being shot down. On all sides, the wreckage of stormbirds and the remains of their brave pilots rained from the skies. Meanwhile, Legio Ataris had continued its own advance and as far as Titan combat was concerned, had approached up to point-blank range with their enemy. They were outnumbered, but the Princeps had already calculated and accepted the poor odds of their survival and engaged the traitors with complete disregard for their own safety. They were hellbent on taking out as many enemy Titans down as they could, and in this they would prove successful. Both sides were taking heavy losses. At the cost of their own near destruction, Legio Ataris' attack effectively neutralized the Legio Mortis contingent. After the explosive engagement, several crippled titans of Legio Mortis attempted a retreat back to the fortress, but they were hunted down by an Iron Hand subjugator group and mercilessly destroyed. But now the disorder and attrition of battle had become so intense that both sides took time to reconsider their situation. In the maelstrom of battle, tactics had essentially become meaningless. Armies large enough to conquer whole star systems had been unleashed in a space no more than 20 kilometers wide. The entire battlefield was littered with wreckage and death. Untold mangled corpses of Astartes and mortals alike lay scattered across the Urgol Depression. It is true that the Loyalists had cut a bloody swath through the traitor's defenses, but Horus's fortress still held strong, and the bulk of their gun positions had not yet been silenced. Troops on both sides were running out of ammunition and were in desperate need of resupply. In the meantime, the troops continued their brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. The sound of bolter fire diminished and was overtaken by the continuous roar of chainswords and clashing steel. But in order to organize another effective assault, the fragmented and battered troops would first have to regroup under their own banners. In this relative lull of the fighting, Korax contacted his brother Primox and called for a strategic withdrawal to gather their forces and wait for the Imperial reinforcements. Their spear tip had done enough to bloody the traitors and earn their glory. 
The still fresh legions would shortly arrive and could easily sweep up the remaining traitors. Vulcan agreed with this sentiment, but Ferris Manus would have none of it. In the rage of battle with the traitors on the back foot, withdrawal was unthinkable to him. Although Ferris held overall command, each Primarch still held supreme authority over their own legion, and Korax ordered his legion to fall back to the drop site to regroup. The hot-headed Gorgon ordered his forces to fight on. Forced to make a difficult decision, Vulcan ultimately chose to follow Korax, and slowly withdrew his salamanders to the rear as well. Ferris Manus was still accompanied by his fiercer Morlock Terminator elites, but in the carnage even their indomitable ranks had thinned. Ever pushing on and not fully realizing the severity of the situation, Ferris Manus and his Iron Hands vanguard were in serious risk of becoming dangerously separated from the rest of the Loyalist army. The War Master would not let such a splendid opportunity go to waste. He knew just the right kind of bait to draw Ferris in even further. It was at this precise moment that through the smoke of battle, Ferris Manus was able to catch a glimpse of Fulgrim. Even had the Gorgon considered the possibility of withdrawal, the sight of his hated Primarch brother within reach inevitably rekindled his resolve. He would not let this chance for vengeance escape him. And so he actively ordered his Iron Hands to move forward against the Emperor's children. Fulgrim noticed the spear tip making their way towards him and taunted his brother. An overwhelming rage overtook the Gorgon. Beyond care of his surroundings, he broke rank and charged at the Phoenician. Ferris unsheathed Fireblade, the very sword he had once forged as a gift for his brother. He had kept it in reserve for this very moment, and already savored the very idea of slaying Fulgrim with it. But the Phoenician was not one to overlook such symbolism himself. He had brought with him Forgebreaker, a mighty warhammer likewise forged by his own hand as a gift for his once beloved brother Ferris Manus. But now there would be no more brotherly affection between these mighty Primarchs, only hatred. Their weapons had once been forged in brotherhood, but now would be wielded in vengeance. And so, with these weapons in hand, Ferris wielding Fireblade and Fulgrim holding Forgebreaker, the two charged at one another. The two Primarchs dueled like two gods, trading monstrously powerful blows that struck with the boom of lightning. All who witnessed their unrestrained power realized a fight of legends was unfolding before their very eyes. In the Urgol Depression, Astartes had fought Astartes in full force. But this was a clash of unyielding demigods, with the strength and ferocity to crush mountains in their wake. With blade and hammer, both warriors caused and received blows that would have killed lesser beings outright. As the fight continued, the remaining legions of the Retribution arrived at Istvan V. The Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors, Night Lords, and Word Bearers hurried to make Planetfall and join the battle. Their combined force would easily end this horrible battle quickly. Meanwhile, the Raven Guard and Salamanders had regrouped at the drop site and began the evacuation of their wounded. The remaining Stormbirds were filled to the brim with grievously injured Astartes. With the reinforcements coming in, they could now be brought to safety, where they could receive proper medical aid. The brave warriors who had fallen in battle could now have their gene seed harvested. A rain of drop pods and landing craft once more filled the skies as the might of five more legions came down to the surface. Ferris Manus rejoiced at the impressive sight. Soon their combined forces would crush their enemies. Surely Fulgrim and the other traitorous Primarchs would pay for their betrayal with their lives. But Fulgrim couldn't help but laugh at the foolish naivete of his brother. Unfortunately, the Gorgon would soon come to understand the reason why. As the Loyalists cheerfully hailed their brother Legion's arrival on the surface, they were met with a grim silence. The reinforcements swiftly deployed around the edges of the Urgol Depression. The Loyalist forces found themselves confused at the lack of communications. Back at the fortress, a single bright red flare was fired into the skies, a signal from Horus for the newly arriving troops. A moment of silence, then as one from all sides, the Alpha Legion, Night Lords, Iron Warriors and Word Bearers opened a hail of bolt fire into the Loyalists gathered at the drop site. The Raven Guard and Salamanders died where they stood, unorganized and utterly shocked by the sudden betrayal. Their initial resistance was minimal. They could simply not comprehend what was happening. The evacuating Stormbirds had been caught by surprise, shot down and crashed back into the planet. Traitor gunships now strafed the Loyalist ground forces. Dreadnoughts that had withstood the worst of the battles were now obliterated like it was nothing. 
by rockets fired at point-blank range. The remnants of the Imperial Army forces caught in the crossfire were being ripped to shreds at an even faster pace. Artillery positions were overrun and destroyed. Taking stock of the dire situation, Primarch Korax and Vulcan knew something had to be done quickly. Korax suggested a full-scale retreat back to their ships in orbit, hoping against all odds that at least some of their transports would make it through. Vulcan did not agree. Fleeing head over heel now would abandon too many to their fate. They did not have enough aircraft remaining to get all Astartes and Army's troops off the planet. And after all, their brother Ferris would never make it back to the drop site in time, and so Vulcan ordered his troops to stand fast. From the fortress, the other traitor legions and the Dies Irae marched triumphantly forward. Their forces would complete the encirclement and join the massacre. Only Ferris Manus and his Terminator elite stood between them and the drop site. Fulgrim promised to let him live, and even offered him a place at the traitor's side. But the Gorgon would have none of it. After witnessing these unexpected betrayals with horror, his rage was even worse than before. He charged with a renewed strength that even Fulgrim could not match, and soon he gained the upper hand in the duel. Furious blow smacked Forge Breaker out of Fulgrim's hands. With his opponent unarmed, Ferris attempted a final murderous strike against his brother. But in desperation, Fulgrim unsheathed the demonically possessed Larum Blade and raised it in his defense. The Demon Blade filled him with a new power. He managed to slash Ferris across the chest and inflict a deep cut that crippled him. With his brother critically wounded on the ground, Fulgrim now found himself in the position to end the Gorgon's life. But somehow he found himself unable to deliver the killing blow. It was the same sympathy that had led him to spare his brother's life before. The impatient demon within the sword took sudden hold of the Primarch's body, and before Fulgrim so much as realized what had happened, the sword had already cleaved through Ferris Manus' neck and decapitated him. The body of the Iron Hand's Primarch sank to the ground and lay still. For the first time ever, a Primarch had died. The bloodlust and haze of battle instantly cleared from Fulgrim's mind. In the new clarity, he repulsed at what he had just done, what he had let himself become. He looked around him and witnessed the depravity of his own legion, his heart filled with grief, sorrow, and most of all, self-pity. But now that he had personally killed his brother, there was no way back. Surrounded by the unspeakable carnage that he had undeniably played a part in, it was all too much for the Primarch of the Third Legion to process. The demon within the sword once more whispered into his mind, offering him a way out of his mental suffering, could offer him absolution. If only Fulgrim would just give in, the demon would grant him the sweet bliss of nothingness. Sickened by the overwhelming grief at his depraved state, the Primarch craved nothing more than to stop his existence. Trusting the soothing voice inside of his head, Fulgrim lowered the defenses of his mind, unwittingly granting the demon complete control. And so it happened that Fulgrim came under total demonic possession. A final wash of panic flushed over him as he realized the grave mistake he had just made. But it was too late. From now on, the psyche of the real Fulgrim was trapped inside a demon-controlled husk. His body was no longer his own. Meanwhile, the Salamanders had attempted a breakout attempt against the Iron Warrior's lines, but to no avail. They had been pushed back to the drop site. Now, Lorgar unleashed his Gal Vorbeck. These blessed sons of Lorgar had traveled into the Eye of Terror and nurtured with the blessings of the Dark Gods. Not even the Emperor's Children Legion had reached a state of corruption such as theirs, and their bodies had mutated into truly monstrous forms. Now these elite troops, possessed by demons, were unleashed against the Loyalists and charged against the Raven Guard en masse. But despite their supernatural blessings, Corvus Corax proved more than a match against these monsters, and using his lightning claws, killed them with impunity. No longer able to bear witness to the wholesale slaughter of his favored sons from the sidelines, Lorgar charged in himself to duel Corax. But the fight would be decisively one-sided. The Urizen had always been more of a scholar than a fighter, while the Raven Lord had honed himself into an ultimate warrior. This mistake would cost Lorgar dearly, as soon he would find himself impaled upon the lightning claws at the mercy of his enraged brother. Corvus had no pity for his brother and was ready to destroy him, but as the final strike fell, it was halted by another set of lightning claws. 
To his surprise, Conrad Kurz had come to Lorgar's rescue and was blocking the killing blow. Too tired to fight another one of his brothers, Korax activated his jump pack and soared away from the duel. Why the Night Lord had saved his brother's life remains unclear, for he was disgusted with Lorgar's weakness and the corruption of his legion. But although grievously wounded, the ward bearer's Primarch would live. The Salamanders made their final stand around the drop site. Their valiant resistance allowed a portion of the Raven Guard to escape. Even several wounded Iron Hands had been successfully evacuated back to orbit. Corvus Corex managed to board a ship, but it was almost immediately shot down and crashed on the outskirts of the Urgol Plateau. The battle of the ships in orbit had not been as favorable for the traitors as they had hoped. Although the sudden betrayal had come just as unexpected for the outnumbered Loyalist fleet, the worst of the initial damage had been soaked up by their active void shields. After realizing what had happened, they returned fire. Unwilling to abandon their legions on the surface, above Istvan V, the fleet engaged in as murderous a battle as the one below. And for the Loyalists, the naval engagement would not be for nothing. Despite the anti-air taking a heavy toll, retreating aircraft came trickling in and embarked on the ships. Wounded Raven Guards, Salamanders, and Iron Hands made it to the Medicaid decks. They had survived and would live to fight another day. Soon, however, the outnumbered fleet realized that sooner or later they would lose this naval engagement. They had only been able to hold out as long as they did through sheer determination and the unwillingness to abandon their legion. But the dreadful news arrived that Ferris Manus and the remaining Iron Hand spear tip had perished. Corvus Corex had been lost and Vulcan had been stuck on the surface. Without hopes of recovering their Primarchs, Loyalist ships started to disengage from battle and began their perilous attempts to flee the system. With the Imperial fleet breaking off, the traitors knew that victory had been assured. Despite all odds, Vulcan and a handful of salamanders were still holding out against the onslaught down below. There was no way off this planet. All available landing craft had already been sent back to orbit. The others had been destroyed. In a display of spite, the Iron Warrior's fleet fired a tactical nuclear payload at the center of the drop site. The orbital strike came crashing in their midst and exploded with the power of a small sun. The immense heat boiled the salamanders alive and everyone caught in the blast vaporized inside of their armor. The remaining loyalist holdout vanished in an instant, but amongst the smoke and dust that now filled the crater that was once the drop site, one figure remained. It was Vulcan. Although the remnants of his legion had perished, the perpetual Primarch had survived the explosion and now lay unconscious in this crater. It was Conrad Kurz who eventually found him, and in secret he hauled the Primarch of the Salamanders to his flagship for imprisonment. The killing had stopped, and the battle was finally over. After a hard-won battle, the traitors had been victorious. The untold dead were turned into large funeral pyres. By nightfall, hundreds of bright red fires illuminated the Urgol Depression as they burned the bodies. Horus emerged from his command post in the fortress and was met by a jubilating crowd cheering his name. Even the mighty Imperator Titan Deesire bowed its head to his glorious triumph. The ashes of the dead rose to the skies and fell like confetti over his mighty army as they celebrated. Horus now had eight whole legions under his command. Three of the remaining nine Loyalist legions had been as good as destroyed. Any surviving Loyalists who had managed to flee the battle were being hunted down at this very moment. On the other side of the galaxy, the Space Wolves and Thousand Suns were busy bloodying each other on Prospero. The word bearers were leading Gilliman's forces into an ambush, and the War Master had traps prepared for all the other legions too. How could the Emperor ever hope to oppose him now? The War Master's victory at Istvan V was complete. On his orders, a huge and blazing eye was ignited upon the northern slopes of the Urgol Depression. With a blazing fury, the symbol of Horus burned itself into the rocks. Engraved in stone, here it would forever remain as a sign of his superiority. With the battle done with, soon, they would embark their ships and travel towards the solar system. The road to Terra is now open. The drop site massacre marks the start of a new era. As the Loyalist forces scramble to halt the traitors, the Great Crusade has officially come to a bitter end. As Horus's betrayal engulfs the galaxy in the flames of civil war, the million worlds of the Imperium shall burn.